say that this morning that you've seen the mountains move this week amen? amen is there anyone that wants to share how God has moved that mountain because sometimes we need to share to just overcome him even more we overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony so who's got a testimony this morning come on there must be someone a lot of people said, Amen, mountains moved. Don't you want to come and share how a mountain is moved for you this week? Amen. Let's encourage one another. That's what a testimony is there for. Maybe there's someone that wants to hear, needs to hear what you've got to share this morning. I know there's a couple that we haven't been seeing for a while, not in our church, but in our circle of friends. And we had a chat with them just in passing by, only to realize that they've gone through such a terrible time. The husband has just been diagnosed with cancer and there were so many things that were happening and he had to go for an operation and the wounds didn't heal and it was a whole bunch of complications and we just sat down right there in the coffee shop on the side of the street and we took hands and we prayed and then the following two days I just followed up with him only to, for him to say that the wound is healing thank you for the prayers the wounds are healing. I am getting better. Now, that's not even my testimony. That's his. But it, it did so much for me and for Anna when we heard this. Doesn't it strengthen your faith? So if God can do it for someone like that, He can do it for you. That mountain in your house that needs moving, He can do it. Just speak to it. Sometimes we need to speak to the mountain so that it can move. That thing in your job that's happening, it can move if you speak to it. If you're standing on the word, standing on the faith that he has given you. And remember, Jesus has faith in you. Do you have faith in him? Do you believe that he can do it? We sang it this morning. Charity, won't you just put up that, that lyric again that says, Your promise still stand, great is your faithfulness. You'll never fail us, Lord. Is there anyone here that can actually say that God has failed them? God has never failed us. He never fails us. His promises still stand. So team, we're going to sing this again. I've seen you move. Who have you seen God move? If we want to know how God is working, we need to be there where He is working. There in your house He's working. In your workplace He's working. In your neighborhood He's working. Out there in the streets He's working. He's not just working here in church. He's working out there. Because that's where we represent Him as followers of Jesus. So we're going to sing this again. And if there's any one of those mountains in your life that needs to move, you need to see it move. You need to see that God has never failed you. Come, come share. You see, I'm going to keep on talking until someone gets with a testimony. Morning church. Um, yesterday was my birthday. Okay. Um, I would have been very ungrateful to have sat down when people are asked to come and give testimony. The second one is um, I saw my wife sleep in the afternoon. I've not seen that in about eight, nine years. Amen. Because she was busy with the kids. So in the afternoon she was sleeping and she was sleeping heavily. Hallelujah. <laughs> And um, what led to that was she was looking for a maid 
for like three years because he was particular about the kind of person that must assist her because my last one is hyperactive. <laughs> He's so hyperactive that he can frustrate you and you can start mistreating him. So she got a maid this month. Thank you. So there's a mountain that was moved. Amen. Anyone else? Anyone else? No one else? As God, as God moves the mountains, you will get to the testimonies. Thank you, team. Let's sing it again. It's amazing how the Lord confirms things. If you just look at the words we've been singing today, and the Lord impressed it on my heart to reinforce this. My God will never fail. He will always triumph. It is His plan. Every war He wages, He will win. And I am going to see a victory. Do you believe that? You know, a lot of you, and that includes a few people very close to me in this church, are battling their own battles. But we have to believe that God is in control and that we will see that victory. Amen. Thank you for that. While we were singing the song, I was just looking at you there from the back. And I want to share something with you this morning. Some of you have turned away from the battle. Some of you have run away scared. I want to remind you of the story of David and Goliath. Where, was, where were the Israelites? They were on the battle line. They showed up. But no one was willing to step out. Not even Saul. Mighty king. Biggest man in Israel. The Bible talks about Saul being so big that he stood head and shoulders above everybody else. And comes this little, little pipsqueak boy. The ugliest one. And he looked at this giant and he said to him, today. Today, I will kill you. I want to say to you, stop running away from the battle. We have to face. David faced the giant. The Israelites, Israelites faced the enemy. And then God showed up on the scene. Sometimes, we start running away from the battle god hasn't given you a spirit of fear but of love of power and a sound mind no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper everything that rises up against me will fall where does that happen in the comfort of my own little space or out there on the battlefield it happens on the battlefield and your battlefield is your family it's your marriage it's your finances it's your children it is all of that it is your health what the enemy has tried for evil God will turn it for who's good for your good and i am a living testimony of that 27 years 28 years ago the devil tried to destroy my marriage and i was in ministry and i messed up big time and i could have died physically i could have died and then God came and he said, Hey, boot. Run to me. Don't run away. Run to me. And now I have an amazing family. What the enemy wanted to destroy, God restored. So much so that the impact that my wife 
and myself and even my two daughters have had in the lives of other people because we became a testimony of God's victory in our lives. Why are you running away from the battle? Stop running. I want to say to you, stop running. Whatever it is that you are busy doing right now, stop. Turn around and face the enemy. And see how God will deliver them into your hand for your good. But there's something that you and I need to do. We need to speak the name of Jesus. Because in the name of Jesus, things are happening. There is still power. We sang it. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every way, war that he wages, he will win. It's not you that's warring, it's him. And if we look at the cross, every battle has already been won. Every curse was already broken. Every sickness was already healed. It's all done. That's why Jesus said, it is done, it is finished. Klar, for bay, it's over. So the only thing that you and I need to do is surrender to that. But we have this question. And maybe it's just me, none of you. What if he doesn't do it? What if he doesn't change? What if? What if? What are you busy doing? We're busy running. Stop running from the battle. Show up in the battle line. And see how God wins your battle for you. But you have to surrender. Some of us are very, in Afrikaans we've got a beautiful word. I'm not going to use it. But it's got to do with you are hard-necked, stiff-necked people ons raak harde kwas in Afrikaans we get hard <laughs> I won't do it I'm a man I won't do it, men stop your nonsense get to God woman let go and let God have his way your finances are not working out why? because you're trying to do it on your own it's not yours to begin with. It's God's. He gave you the power to work and create wealth for yourself. Absolutely. But all of that belongs to him anyway. Oh, don't hold on to that stuff. Whatever we hold on to, we eventually, eventually lose. Don't hold on to it. Let it go. We've been busy with consecration. To come closer, move closer to God means I need to forsake all. I need to let it all go. Stop holding on. Face the giant. Speak the mighty name of Jesus. Stop what it is that you are doing that's not right. Remember last time or the week before I said to you, I'm not here to tell you what you're doing wrong. You know that anyway. You know what you're doing wrong. I don't have to tell you that. But what I can tell you is that God is still on the throne. And if God can do it for me, if God can do it for my family, if God could restore me, if God could heal people that I've seen, prayed for, healed, if God could release people from addiction and bring them out of darkness into marvelous light, that's the only thing that we need to do. It's only one step. There's only one step. There's not five steps to get rid from your depression or five steps to get rid of your addiction or five steps to get... It's one step. You step out of darkness into light. So you and I choose. So I, wanna, I want to urge you today. We're going to sing the song again. You don't have to sit, uh, stand. You can just sit there. And this is between you and the Lord. And you know the battles that you are, fight, that you are facing and that you are busy fighting. And I want to see you showing up at the battle line. And I want you to see the, the Goliath, that whatever that giant is. And I want to see you calling on the name of Jesus. And I want, to see, I want you to see that that giant is falling because you call on the name of Jesus, but you're facing the battle. Jesus faced the cross, man. He didn't run away from it. He submitted. He said, Lord, 
I don't want to do this, but whatever I need to, that's what we're supposed to be doing on a Sunday morning. We have our own agendas. We've got our own little programs that we need to do. But I'm asking the Holy Spirit this morning to move amongst us. And if you feel led to pray for someone, make sure that you are led by the Spirit to speak to the giant. Maybe you are going to be the David for that person that you need to pray for this morning. So that they can see the giant fall in their lives. Amen. Let's do it. Just there where you're standing. We're going to see the victory. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Amen. We thank you for your presence, Lord. We thank you that you are here. Thank you that you are moving in our midst, ministering to each and every single one of us at our point of need. All we have belongs to you, Lord. It's all about you, Father. We thank you for this time. We praise your name. We honor you. We magnify you. In Jesus' name. You guys can just stay here. You can, you can sit. But the musicians can just stay. You can just have a seat, Jess. I don't want us to just leave. Fonny, you can just keep it going, my friend. Turn to your neighbor and say to him or her, God's got a plan for your life. Now say to that same person, do you know what it is? And then you also ask that person, are you in the plan? Or are you making your own plans? Sometimes we make our own plans. Sometimes we hold on to stuff. Maybe it's hurt. Maybe it's disappointment. Maybe it's real stuff. God is speaking to us and we're saying, oh, no, 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 Lord, I'm not ready for that yet. Come back to me in five years and we'll talk about it again. I want Vinanda, she's ready there. I just wanted to come and share something with you this morning that I think is very relevant to what it is that we've been speaking about over the past couple of months, basically. And I'm not going to share the sermon with you today. God is moving in a very special way amongst us. But there's a couple of things that I just want to, to share with you. And then we're going to come to the table of the Lord and we're going we're gonna to enjoy remembering what Christ did for you and me. Amen. So Vinanda, come and share with us. The handheld is here in the front. And this is something that we hold on to so dearly. And But she's going to share the story with you from the Bible. So please, share with us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um... So, I'm sure we've all heard about the story when Jesus fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. And he got it from a little boy. And that little boy gave everything he had to Jesus. Everything. He didn't give four loaves and one fishy. He gave everything. And we read it in Matthew 14, there about, what, 17, verse 17. And um, this was actually a test of faith for everyone that was in that time and for us as well. Because uh, are we keeping back our time, our talents, our treasures, um, our families, 
our children from the Lord? Or are we willing to give that to Him? And uh, I just want to demonstrate you guys something simple but quite clever. So can I have a volunteer? It can be anyone. Fun. Okay. Femi. Okay. <laughs> so, how many corners does this paper have? Four. Okay. I'm playing card. And you are the little boy. What I want you to do is, I want you to cut off a corner and give it to me. <laughs> How many corners do you have now? No. <laughs> How many corners do you have? One, two, three, four, five. So this is this is his time that he's giving to Jesus. You're the little boy. Okay, now cut off the next corner. And this is, let's say, your family or your children. How many corners do you have now? Five, six. six corners. Okay, the next one. How many? Five, six, seven. seven. <laughs> no. <laughs> Counting. <laughs> Counting. Two, three, four, five, six, eight corners. Okay. Just for fun, just for fun, cut off that corner for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that creates a little corner as well. So it's ten corners. So the more you cut off corners, the more you get. Thank you. You want to keep the paper? <laughs> so we find that we are so scared to give God something because we're scared there's nothing left for us. Where's my time going? Where's my money going? Am I going to have enough finances to come through the, the month? And um, just a, a little testimony from my side is I was saving up for a car for I think almost a year. And there was a time that it's, uh, you know, I help up where I can. I'm like, but Lord, I have enough money to buy the car now. Why can't I buy it like now? Like, no, give me and wait. So I gave and I waited. And the same month I got my driver's license. The week after I bought my car. So just showing what we give. We're not left with nothing. We have something much, way much better. And that's the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. I want you to look at one of these corners. This is what was cut off. How many corners are there now? But it used to be one corner. So when I give God my time, what does he do? He multiplies it. Everything that you give to God is multiplied. I gave her to God when she was a little baby. And look what God has done in her life. He's multiplied. We gave God this ministry. 17 years ago almost what did he do he multiplied when I look at the church's finances every month we make budget our income doesn't say that but what does he do he multiplies that's the God that you serve come on man are you excited about it <laughs> We said that God has got a plan for your life. Now, when this church was built many, many years ago, they also had to draw some plans. 
And it's amazing to come across these things because some of them were actually drawn up in 1964. This church was established in 1957. And this is the plan. Look at this. The church that you are sitting in today started with a plan. And you can come and have a look at them. There is a plan, an overhead plan for the building, where the building is going to be and how the parking is going to be put out. And they even put in some trees and there is the storeroom and the, the toilets and, and then the proposed new building. This was before they uh, built the, the hall at the top with Pastor Kleinans all those years ago. They were still proposing the plan. And then they actually drew the plan for the hall. And this plan, if I'm not mistaken, was drawn up in 1977. Yeah. No, 78. 21st of, Nov uh, 21st of uh, uh, February 1978. Did it go according to plan? Is the building standing? Come on guys, is the building standing? Okay. Why is it standing? Oh uh, yes, there was a firm foundation definitely, but what else? Why did why is this building working? Because there was a plan. And the builders followed the plan. Okay. And then we came to the ministry around about 2007 and 2008. And then we had to redraw some of the plans of the church. Look at this. And then, because Pastor Mike and myself, we've often been talking about what's going to happen when we need a bigger church. So we even started thinking about that. And there's some plans here for that even as well. 2008, 2007. Now, some of this hasn't realized yet because we're still waiting for you to make disciples so that they can come and join us in our family of faith but this is the plan if we want to go to where it is that God wants us to go we need to follow his plan Jesus said if you want to follow me you have to forsake everything. You have to leave it all behind and follow me. We, we shared the story about the rich young man that couldn't do that. He was sad because he had so much wealth. And he, he, did all, he, he was holding on and he was doing all the commandments and following everything in the law. And he was a perfect example of a wonderful Christian. But when Jesus said to him, sell everything you have, give it to the poor and follow me, he went away sad because he was holding on to stuff. God had a plan for him. He decided no. And then we were talking about people. That you have to, he that doesn't hate his mother, his father, his brother or his sister is not fit for the kingdom. In other words, we must love him more. That the love that we have for him, in comparison with the love that we have for people, that love actually looks like hate. It's not that I'm hating them, it's just I don't love them as much as what I love God. That's what his disciples did. Those two things were commanded to you and me. But then there's a couple of other things, and I just briefly want to touch on this. Might, some of the scriptures might appear, some of them might not. Because I just want to remind you about God's plan. God's got a plan of ev for every single one of us in this church. Some of us are following the plan. Some of us have deviated from the plan. Some of us have never ever thought about maybe even getting into the plan because it doesn't fit my plan. Because that is scary. So I become fearful. And fear will rob me of my faith. And then I end up doing everything I want to do and nothing that God wants me to do. So we can talk about that as well. But there's, there's three things that I just want to tell you that this thing is going to fall off. <laughs> Who of you have children? 
Come on, let me see your hands. Okay. Do you know that your children speak like you? Do you know that? Your children hopefully also look a little bit like you. Okay, thanks Femi. I'm glad to hear that. Lo and behold, in my case, your children will even start driving like you. So some of you are driving maybe not so well. So maybe change your driving because your kids will drive like that too. The way you handle your finances. Your children will also handle their finances like that. Why is that? Because you model the way as a parent. When you're in a job environment and you've been working for a company for many, many years and you're in a position of leadership maybe and a new person is appointed, the boss might bring that new person to you and say to you, please show this person the ropes, get them going. Why? Because you know what needs to be done. Isn't that so? So you end up modeling the way to the new employee. They will do as you do. They will follow what you do, all of that, because you've been doing it for so many years and you're still around. So there are three things that Jesus also modeled. And if you and I want to be a disciple, it means that we have to be like Christ. Isn't that so? We have to be Christ-like. Isn't that where the word Christian comes from? Is to be like Christ. When I become a disciple, I become like him. So if you read that scripture of so Luke 6 verse 40, you can put it up there just quickly. It says a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained. In other words, someone that is completely fit and rightly ordered. In other words, they are making and they are doing the same thing as the person that trained them, will be like his teacher. Someone that is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Now, if we want to be disciples of Christ, we need to also see what he's done. He's modeled the way. We, 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 we wear these little bracelets, WWJD. What would Jesus do? It's not even that. We should change it to, what did Jesus do? It's not what would, it's what did. So one of the things that we're talking about here is something called place. Are you in the place where Jesus wants you to be? And when I'm talking about place, I'm also talking about where you live. Where you work. So what are you going to do when God says to you, I want you to move? Maybe he's going to say to you, I want you to move to another country. Some of you have done that. Maybe he says to you, I need you to move to another job environment. Isn't that what Jesus did? Where did he come from? Where did Jesus come from? What is Jesus' idea of a place? John 16 verse 28. If you ever wondered where Jesus came from. I come forth from the Father. And I have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and I go to the Father. Then we read John 17 verse 5. It says, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself. With the glory which I had with you before the world was. So Jesus was never bound by place. He left heaven. Glorious heaven. Everything that he needed. He was there before the world began. Because everything that God created, he created in the name of Jesus. You're going to read Acts. So Jesus said, I'm stepping out because my father said I should. 
So Jesus wasn't connected to any place. Sometimes we connect to places because it's lacquer. Let me share a little testimony with you, and you've heard this before. 17 years when Dr. Mike came here from an amazing ministry where everything was in place. Big church, between five and 800 members. When there was an event, there was well over a thousand people attending events. He had an assistant pastor. He had an established leadership. Wonderful things happen. And then God said, move. He could have said, you know what, Lord? Yeah, I'm comfortable here, man. I'm getting a salary. The guys are okay. You know, it's comfortable. Yet God said, move. I was in a position at that time as a praise and worship leader, as a music coordinator in another assembly, earning a bit of money from the assembly. And then Dr. Mike phoned me and said, Wenzel, I need you. Meanwhile, God was already busy working with me, telling me, if you don't go, someone else can't grow. And I didn't want to until I got the phone call. Then I, I, I knew, hey, but you need to go. So are we connected to place? Or are we willing to leave when God says leave? When God says go? When it's enough, it's enough. So how did Je what did Jesus think about place? If you read the scripture in Matthew 8 verse 19 and 20, and it says, Then a certain scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. A scribe. And Jesus said to him, Now this is a very interesting scripture. Foxes have holes. And birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. What does it mean? It means that Jesus isn't connected to place. The guys that did the course yesterday with us on Friday survey of the Bible, when we spoke about the movements of Jesus, can you still remember? Capernaum and Bethany and Jericho and Jerusalem and Berea and he was all over the place. He never had his own place. He went where his father sent them. And he stayed in other people's houses. Yo, Vinsel, but that's Jesus. I'm not Jesus. No, 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 I'm not saying that. But what will you do if he says to you, leave Joburg. Go and live in Valcom. Some of you don't even know where that is. Or Pit Sonder Waterfontein. Oh, there's a beautiful name. Two buffels with one squid, most do it, geskiet fontein. That's a station, by the way. <laughs> there is such a place. <laughs> what would you do? So when we've made the decision to follow Jesus and to become a mature disciple, what is our theme for this year? Follow Him. So what does it mean? Where you go, I go. Where you lead, I'll follow. Do we really do that? Because it's a little bit emotional. Jesus never commanded this. He never commanded this. He never said, you need to. But he modeled the way. Like you and I model the way to our kids. So place is a very important part if you look at what happened with Philip and the guys from yesterday you guys remember Philip Philip was the uh, hey, Jay, Jay, uh, Jane what was Philip again he was the evangelist All right and he got the ball going what happened to Philip Jesus spoke to him or well, the angel spoke to him in Acts chapter 8 verse 26 27 now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying arise and go towards the south Okay, towards the south. Okay, that, that, that's quite broad. Along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. It's a desert. So what did he do? What did Philip do? No, he went to fast for two weeks. 
He went on fasting. He phoned his pastor and said, Pastor, please pray about this. The angel of the Lord told me to go to the south, but there's a desert. We have to fast about this. Is that what Philip did? Philip was busy with a big crusade where he was at the time. He was an evangelist. He was preaching the gospel. He was doing well. It was running on. It was like a church. It was a wonderful vibe. And in the middle of it, God said, go. So what did Philip do? If you read verse 29, it said, Then the Spirit said to Philip, oh, sorry, verse 27, it said, So he arose and went. He didn't go into a fasting mode. He did it. And then verse 29 says, Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake the chariot. Because there was this Ethiopian traveling. And you guys that read the story will know that he ended up speaking to the Ethiopian. Interpreting the scripture. And what happened after that? Once he'd done it. Immediately Philip was transported. You think it only happens in Star Trek. It happened in the Bible. Immediately Philip was transported from the place where he was back. He didn't even have to run or walk. He was just boing, back to where he was. Do you believe that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow? Do you think it can still be done? There's a testimony I want to share with this with you before we come to communion. There's a testimony about a missionary that had to get to Israel. And he was flying from France over to Israel to go and do some work there. But he missed his flight. And he didn't have any money to book another flight. Now he is in a Charles de Gaulle, which is the French airport. And he's walked in the terminal building and he was praying. And he was saying to his father, he said, Lord, I've missed my flight. I don't know. What, I, I need to get to Israel. I need to get to Tel Aviv. What am I going to do? I, I, I need to get there. And God said to him, keep walking. And he was like now having a little conversation with the Lord. Lord, it's a little bit far to walk. Eh? You know, walking to Israel is a little bit further than just walking down the shop. God said to him, keep walking, keep going. You know what happened? The moment he walked out of Charles de Gaulle Terminal, he was in Israel. God instantly transported him. He was there before the airplane. <laughs> the flight that he was supposed to be on hasn't even arrived. And he's there. How's that for flight time? How's that for jet lag? That's the God that you serve. Amen? Amen? But are you willing? Are you and I willing to give up place and say, Lord, let's make up our minds now. And this is, remember, we spoke about it last week or the week before, where Jesus said, count the cost. You and I need to count the cost of becoming a mature disciple of Christ. If I want to follow Jesus with all of my heart, and I want to love him with all of my mind, all of my soul, all of my strength, and everything of my being, what does it mean? I'll do whatever he tells me to do. So there's a cost involved here. It's going to cost you. First of all, it's going to cost you leaving your parents, loving God more than your wife and your kids, letting go of your money, your stuff, your belongings, because you are not fit for the kingdom if you don't forsake it all. For, that's the two things that he commanded. But the rest, he didn't. He modeled it. Charity, can you just put up that slide, please? So I can just show what we are talking about. If you look at the first part here, this was mandated by, for disciples by Jesus Christ. In other words, people, we hate everyone for Christ. In other words, we choose Christ above everyone else. Then the other one that was mandated and commanded was our possessions. Forsake all for Christ. In other words, we surrender to Christ everything that we own. We've made that decision last time. Now the things that he's modeling is only three. Place, position, and priority. We'll talk about the others a little bit later. But place, 
you accept any, uh, sorry, you relocate as Christ directs. Where you live, where you work, maybe even the, the school that you send your kids to. Move to any new location. Now here's the challenge. To what level are you willing to go? Yeah, Lord, it's okay, I'll move, as long as I move in the same town, that's fine. But what if he sends you to Valcom? Where you don't feel so Valcom. <laughs> oh, no, Bill, what happens if he sends you to Afghanistan? Or maybe you'll like it if he sends you to England, because at least the people, they speak English. So at least you've got culture and language thing going. But now, maybe he says to you, move to Nigeria. They, I know Femi will go, but God won't tell him. What if he says, I want you to move to Iraq? <laughs> move to Iraq. Can you see where we're going with our relationship with God? It's not just a superficial thing anymore. That's why you and I have to count the cost. So when we get to consecration, and when we speak about consecration, the most, the biggest act of consecration we ever saw was Jesus Christ. Amen? He left heaven. He came to earth. He went to the cross. He had to sit with all of the nonsense of the disciples. Because they were full of nonsense sometimes. And the unbelief of people. And the ridicule of the church. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the other seas. But yet he said, not my will, but your will be done. So here's the challenge for us as a church. For us as individuals. As people of the Lord. Who calls ourselves, we call ourselves Christians. Are we willing to do what he tells us to do? No, Lord, the pastor must do that. No, 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 he's not asking the pastor, he's asking you. And for some of you, I, I, I can see there's some expression on your faces. Now, the people don't see what I see, thank goodness. But God has been speaking to some of you about some stuff. God has been speaking to you about letting stuff go and maybe even moving. Maybe even changing something. But you're holding on. Now, consecration, when it comes to the communion table, like I said, the greatest act of consecration was given to us and the example was given to us by Jesus. You guys can come stand here next to me. We serve together. Setting ourselves aside for Christ is important. As we commit ourselves to God and we take this communion, communion reminds us, because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. What did Jesus do? He took up his cross and he did whatever needed to be done. So when you and I say, we are eating of this bread and drinking from this cup, we're doing it in remembrance of what Jesus did. It means that I will also take up my cross. And remember, that's a scripture, one of the scriptures that we also read. You must take up your cross and you must follow me. And remember when we spoke about cross, when Jesus was carrying that cross, nobody, nobody wondered what he was doing. Nobody was, what is that guy doing? Is he stupid or what? Why is he carrying that piece of wood? Is he not lacquer? Everybody knew. When somebody carried the cross, they were going to die. There was, no, there was no wondering what if this is going to happen. So when you take up your cross and people look at you, what do, they, what do they see? They see a surrendered life. They see you surrendering to the leading of what God wants you and me to do. There's no discussion. There's no wonder of what if. There goes someone that's following Christ. Because I can see the cross. And that's why Paul could say, say to the church in Corinth, and we spoke about the Corinth church yesterday, 
where he said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. How many times have we said as parents to our kids, don't do what I do, do as I say. <laughs> Haven't we done that? No. Your kids will do what you do. So are you and I doing what Christ wants us to do? So the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread. And obviously, there was also a washing of feet happening. Thank you, ladies, for doing the communion table. I really appreciate it. We don't always give thanks, but thank you for that. He took the bread and he broke it. He obviously gave thanks. He broke it and he said, this is my body which has been broken for you. And then they had supper together. And after supper, it was custom to also have a bit of wine. Because the water that time wasn't so good, eh? So he took the cup after supper and he said, This is the cup of the new covenant. This is something new. Because what I'm doing is I'm instituting a brand new relationship between me and you. But if you drink from this cup and you eat from this bread, you will do it in remembrance of me because this is the symbol of my blood that was shed for you. And, when you, when, and then it says, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you actually proclaim, proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So as we serve you this morning, I want you to hold on to the emblems. and We're going to partake together. But you need to understand, we are now proclaiming. What are we proclaiming? The Lord's death until he comes. Guess what? He's not dead anymore. <laughs> because he's coming back. Amen? So we're declaring, proclaiming the death. In other words, I'm proclaiming that whatever is in my life, because I'm a child of God, everything that is not of God is dead. Amen? So I surrender everything unto death. Because I've counted the cost. And I've decided to follow Jesus. There's no turning back, as we used to sing in Sunday school. So we're going to take off this bread. Thank you, Charles. You can serve. Start on my left here. We thank you, Lord, that we can proclaim the death of Jesus until he comes. We thank you that you were broken so that I don't have to be broken. We thank you that we can surrender it all to you. And we thank you for the cross. Take and eat in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for the blood. We thank you, Lord, that there is still power in the blood. We thank you, Lord, that it washed us clean like virgin snow. Thank you, Lord, that it is a new covenant. We thank you for that forgiveness. We thank you, Lord, that this is life. Because you have come to give us life in all of its fullness. We thank you for the blood. In Jesus' name, let's take and drink. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. Holy Spirit, we thank you for ministering to us this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you, that you were here. We thank you, Lord, for meeting our needs. We thank you, Lord, that we could just bring you glory and give you honor. We thank you, Lord, that we can even give to you as you've given so much to us. We thank you, Lord, that we can see multiplication when we give. Because we give from our heart with joyful and gladness, not out of compulsion. And Lord, we're not only talking about our money, we're talking about us. We give ourselves. That song says, we give ourselves away so that you can use us. You can multiply the little bit 
that we can give to you. Because in your hands, everything is possible. We thank you that we can even pray, pray for the people that watched us online this morning who couldn't join us here in the church. And we thank you that your Holy Spirit also there with them, moving amongst them. Because where two or three are gathered together, even in this electronic cyberspace that we have, you are there with them. We thank you for ministering to, to them as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.